you got real quiet. Thanks. Excellent. So um, our next speaker is uh, Casey Smith, and uh, his uh, talk is Tap, 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 Is This Thing On? Thank you. Thank you. OK, so like you said, my name is Casey Smith. We're going to be talking about testing EDR capabilities. You can connect with me on Twitter, at SubT. Thanks for uh, being in my talk or watching it live. So things we're going to cover today, really four things. We're going to talk about a really high level what EDR is, just to make sure everybody understands what it is that we're testing, uh, what I propose as test methodologies, some tools that we've created, and then some example tests that we've built to help you know if the detections are working properly. So the origins of the term EDR originally was endpoint threat detection and response. Really, we've dropped the threat and focusing on detection and response. And the idea is we're instrumenting the endpoint to tell us information and using that information to detect adversarial activity. So things that you might see inside of EDR data, you can expect to collect things like process information, so command line, module loads, child processes. Uh, these might be other indicators network. From a, from, a, from a host perspective, the network. So you'd get a directionality or a direction of the connection, an IP address, a port number. Uh, any domain names that the host tried to call out to or look up, uh, potentially registry modifications or file modifications, uh, API calls. So if I'm interested in things like create remote thread or open process with writable permissions to another process, some of those type of things would be really interesting uh, on the endpoint. And potentially correlating that with log data. So you, you take all of these sort of facets, this becomes sort of the senses that a defender has on an endpoint, and then now we're going to write detections based on what we collect. So the challenge that we're faced with, or one of the things I do quite a bit uh, working at Red Canary doing research there is testing to see, is it actually working? So how do I know if we're collecting the right telemetry, if my detections are actually going to be viable? And so that's what I want to explore in this talk with you and get your feedback on some of the tools we've created in the research. The, the tool that we've built is really heavily leveraging the MITRE attack framework. Is anybody from MITRE here? I think there's maybe some folks here. So really, really solid uh, research here. Uh, MITRE attack, if you haven't seen this, this framework is what I think is one of the best taxonomies as far as uh, different techniques that attackers will use. And so it gives us that common language. And then this is what we built our tool on to say, how do I test to make sure I can map or see the things that MITRE has classified? And so we'll talk about these. So MITRE attack, again, this is not my work. This is their work. I want to just make sure that's clear and, and point you to their website to, to get additional information. Well, we created, uh, my colleague Mike and I created this project called Atomic Red Team. And it's out there on GitHub. You can go download it and test it. We really want your feedback. And what this allows us to do is create portable tests, open source, to test against that framework. So if there's a particular technique that you're not sure if you detect, can catch or not, uh, that's what the Atomic Red Team is really designed to do. So we actually sent Mike on a mission to the National Atomic Testing Museum in Nevada so you can actually get that picture for the slide, so. Okay, what were the goals of the project? Really a minimal footprint. We had in mind small security teams that maybe weren't sure where to start with their testing. So we also wanted to validate vendor claims. There's a lot of things in the marketplace where they say we catch X, Y, Z. Uh, let's, let's test that assumption and make sure that it catches what they say they're going to catch. And we also wanted to put forward uh, the techniques and say, answer the question, how did they do that? So you might read a threat report and ask yourself, well, what was that tool? How did it work? Um, and, and we wanted to expose that and make it open source so you could see and sort of demystify attacker tradecraft. Okay. So how do we actually use the Atomic Red Team? The first thing we would do is we're going to go through three examples. Uh, there are a lot of examples. We've got about 96 techniques that we've uh, written scripts for or, or basic atomic tests. So these are really basic examples. Some of these you've probably heard, but they give us an idea to point back to the framework. So some of you have probably heard of the RedServe32 technique. Is everybody familiar with this a little bit, some of you? OK. Uh, what's that? <laughs> So uh, when I first found this in like April of 2016, I named it Squibbly Doo, not thinking anybody would ever see the name, and it stuck. So if you hear Squibbly Doo, that's what this is. It's kind of a troll on naming vulnerability. So uh, the idea here is, if you want to look at RedServe32, which is a built-in binary, we can go out to the Atomic Red Team, pull down the repo, 
And I encourage you to study the technique first. So go again, going back to MITRE, MITRE's catalog, this technique, it gives an ex case studies or examples of attackers using this in the wild. So we're going to take this technique and now we're going to actually run some tests against it. So what is, what's in our repo for this would be, here's the technique, 1117. How does this technique actually work? Well, there's two ways to run a payload with RedServe32. It's a signed default binary. You can either run a local file or you could have RedServe32 reach out over the internet and pull something down and execute it, which is really the, the thing that I'll show you here in a moment. So we have a test case. Down at the bottom, we have a test scriptlet. So normally, RedServe32 executes and registers com objects. The cool thing about RedServe32 with the URL is it'll actually reach out, pull down an XML file, uh, and run that in your environment. So it's really good for bypassing things like antivirus, uh, application whitelisting, et cetera. If you look at that test script, Ours is very basic. You can certainly customize that if you wanted to. On line nine, we're just going to pop calc on the target machine. But you could certainly chain these together, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. But this is sort of the, the very basic uh, capability for Scriptlet. Uh, Nick Carr does a good uh, job on Twitter of posting different uh, daily Scriptlet examples if you want to follow him. Uh, good stuff there. OK, so we've got the test. We know how to run RedServe32. What does this look like as far as atomic testing? Like, what are, what are we actually going to see? So going back to what I talked about earlier, there's multiple facets that, that might drive our detection. We might ask ourselves, what did we see? Did we see the process create RedServe32? Did we see these parameters or arguments on the command line? Slash S suppresses warning. Slash U performs an uninstall. Slash I passes a parameter in, which is going to then execute the code at the URL. So we have network data. And then we have module load. So something loading scrub J, for example. Uh, now, you know, as you may ask yourself, uh, if any one of these changed, would I still detect it? So for example, if I changed the file name, just copied RedServe32 somewhere else and renamed it, or scrub J and renamed it. So you may want to drive your detections looking at things like original, original file name that's signed as opposed to just the name that appears on the command line. But all of these really in our testing framework are going to generate that telemetry that hopefully allows you to see the detection. So then you would ask yourself, did we detect the RedServe32? Did we prevent it? Did we even see it? So if an attacker's leveraging these built-in signed tools, these would be things we'd want to go back in, look at in our detection software. OK, so another process, or another technique that we've defined in our framework. Uh, again, MITRE has called this, recently renamed this to process injection, or think DLL injection. There's a number of attacker tradecraft tools that drop a DLL to disk, and then execute it in some form or another. So there's, you know, I kind of br broke some of these out. There's DLL search order hijacking, side loading. Uh, NetSH, if you pass it the right parameters, will ingest and load uh, a DLL. So there's a NetSH helper. Uh, App init, which inject themselves into multiple processes, is a register key that does that. So there, there's a lot of different things that load a DLL. So one of the things that we thought was fun was we created a DLL called All the Things. Uh, and this is one DLL that can be loaded many ways. So uh, currently we have seven techniques or harnesses to ingest this DLL, and they map directly back to the MITRE framework. So install util, reg SVCS, reg ASM, reg serv32, run DLL, ODBC conf. So, so sort of the DLL presents all of the necessary parameters to be ingested. Now, if you know your Windows utilities, you'll recognize some of those are managed tools, .NET, or some of those are unmanaged tools. And that's uh, leveraging a framework called unmanaged exports. So we can build a binary in our framework that allows us to have both export uh, functions and .NET data. So one DLL, this is really useful from an attacker perspective because if the binary is being analyzed by a sandbox, it may get detonated one way when it's executed on the adversary's target and another way in the sandbox. So pretty cool stuff. Check out unmanaged exports. So Again, in our testing framework, we've got the open source capability so you can build all the things uh, and test those against your system. So that's available in the Atomic Red Team framework. OK, one last talk on the uh, capability. So one of the techniques is trusted developer tools. And so if you haven't seen this, there's some really cool functionality in MS Build called inline tasks. And what this allows you to do. Uh, in line 8 is define the task in XML. On line 17, define your C-sharp code. MS Build will ingest that code, compile it in memory, and execute it. So it's a really, really fascinating tool to bypass a lot of products. Uh, you might want to check it out. Uh, so one interesting component is the XML file. The extension doesn't really matter. In fact, if you look at MS Build, you just have to call it from the command line. 
and it will look in its current working directory and look for any project files and execute those automatically. So here you can see we're uh, able to run the code fragment uh, just by running MS build. So there's no command line detection on that other than the fact that MS build ran. So when we're testing these frameworks, this is the kind of thing we want to be looking for is like, okay, so if MS build runs, there's very limited command line detection, but maybe that process is not normal for that host. Maybe MS build starts making network connections. Maybe MS build pulls in PowerShell DLL. So those are the other attributes. So you start looking at maybe using the atomic red team framework to test these different components. Okay. So we looked at RedServe 32, process injection. Uh, like I said, we've got about 96 uh, techniques that are in our framework today. Uh, we want feedback and we want you guys to help us update that. So uh, we're looking to the community to give us additional updates or, or feedback. So the thing is, though, techniques rarely occur in isolation, right? Very, very rarely is an attacker going to land on a box and just run MS build. So what we want to look at next is how do I chain these tests together? So let's look at an example. This is from a, just a threat report I pulled uh, offline. The reference is at the bottom of the page there. This is a very common thing that you see starting from an email uh, all the way through the chain. But two that I just would call attention to would be, OK, the attacker at this point drops a DLL to disk. At this point, they run Squibbly-Doo or Red Surf 32 to reach out and pull down more uh, XML and execute that on the environment. So if you're a defender, you should ask yourself, would we catch this, right? What and how would I actually test of that assumption that we would catch that attack? So we started calling these, Mike and I started calling these chain reactions, so kind of keying off the atomic theme. The idea here is let's take the MITRE attack matrix and let's start then going through and mapping from a threat report different components that we want to provide coverage for and let's write a script or a harness to test all these components. So this is just uh, picking a few that we saw off the report but let's look at what it would look like in the MITRE framework to map back to your atomic test. So MITRE's done a great job of uh, tracking groups and different techniques that groups will use. So here we're looking at a group that's got a couple different names, APT32, Ocean Lotus. Um, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see a couple of components that this group uses. They use scheduled tasks, they use RedServe32, and they use PowerShell. So running our atomic test, what we want to do is let's make sure if we, you know, and again, I'm, I'm distilling this down into some simple examples, but hopefully this is making sense as far as how could we test, would we catch this actor if they showed up in our environment? So we, we use, basically use batch files and PowerShell scripts for our Windows environment. Uh, we've got tests for both Mac and Linux capabilities, but if we look at a Windows example, there's, there's no infrastructure or DevOps to stand up and run these tests. We really wanted to make it as simple as possible for small security teams to immediately start getting value to make sure that their detection tools are catching what they say they're catching. So in step one, we just simply create the scheduled task. That scheduled task maps to RedServe32 in step two, and then we have a, a, a harness there uh, using PowerShell to do a time stomp. So it's going to go out and stomp the file, uh, which is the first atomic test date timestamp. So July 16th, 1945. If you ever see that, it's probably a bad day. So, But anyway, you get the idea. Right? So the idea is these particular uh, test cases can be chained together. So then you would ask yourself, did you see that? And that's something I ask on a daily basis, running different tests, like running new tools and things like, hey, did you see that? Did you see any of that? I mean, are there any artifacts that this EDR tool is, is collecting, process, network, logs? Did any of that get collected? And if so, could I then use that to pivot further uh, into the investigation? So do I have a tip-off to say, hey, this, this led me to this, to this, to this, okay? So those are three examples of test cases we've written in Atomic. Uh, things that I think are helpful with the Atomic Red Team is there's no agent to install. Uh, we really wanted to avoid, like, a bias of a, an analyst saying, oh, that's just running from the agent. So we really wanted to try and just simulate actual activity. Uh, there's no dependency on order uh, as far as chaining these together. Uh, we wanted to produce the telemetry trails in your environments so that you could go in and look and see, did this attack the noise that's going to be detected? Give you the ability to study and mimic adversarial activity, so demystify, so to speak, some of the things that these actors are doing. Um, and then, of course, run our payloads, run our tests. It's all open source. so. Uh, feel free to use it uh, and customize it to what makes sense for you. Okay, so that's really the atomic framework. Some of our some of the uh, questions that I wanted to explore, and some of the other things that I look at in my research would be things like, what about attack or techniques that are not on the matrix? I mean, if I'm an attacker, that list is a no-go list now, right? So I'm going to move off the list and start exploring new things. 
So we don't want to assume uh, that our apps are going to follow a script just like our detection tools might. So I love this quote. It's from uh, the book Crypt Cryptography Engineering. And it says, our opponents are intelligent, clever, malicious, and devious. They'll do things nobody has ever thought of before. So the idea is let's start thinking about what are the techniques that are missing and provide that feedback. Again, we don't maintain that for the um, techniques. We really want you to push that back to MITRE, and we'd be happy test cases. I think there was an update that came out on Tuesday, uh, like with some MSHTA and a couple other new techniques, and we have Mimikatz loader uh, within a few hours for MSHTA. So we're happy to share that and start getting the visibility uh, on detection. So another question would be, how do you actually trust a compromised host, right? So what attackers start poking at the actual sensor or the tool that's collecting the data that's producing the trying to detect? Um, there was some really good research Graber earlier this year produced uh, a, a white you can check out, but this he gave a talk at DerbyCon keynote, and the idea was subverting trust in Windows. And what Matt found in his research was in the industry, the validation for, say, Authenticode, there's registry keys. You could provide your own DLL and function to make uh, assertions on whether that file uh, is signed or not. So really want to encourage you to check out Matt's research uh, because, again, it's a compromised host. Are, is your endpoint software making decisions or trust decisions that the endpoint is telling you? How does that play out in reality? Well, we, we've seen like uh, a tool that Josh Pitts wrote called Sig Thief combined with Matt's research. The end result here is I can make Mimikatz look like to the endpoint a trusted host or a signed Microsoft binary. We steal the signature from one machine or one binary slap it onto the base of the other, other binary and then change those registry keys so that our function always returns true when it tries to validate the certificate. Cryptographically, it doesn't match at all. The hash is wrong and the, the publisher chain may not work, but the idea here is according to the operating system calls, it's fine. So definitely check out that research and just a shout out uh, to uh, Josh and Matt for that uh, tool as well. So again, what happens when your adversaries start tampering with your endpoint detection software. So we're providing the test. Uh, we're mapping to the MITRE framework. Uh, just a couple things to wrap up, and I wanted to provide a couple minutes for questions. I think we're closing in on time here. So uh, the thing is, we, li we like Atomic. It's easy to use. We know we're not the best out there. There's a ton of, there's a couple other frameworks we'll talk about in a minute. There's Caldera. Uh, there's Unfetter. Uh, so Mike and I like to joke we're like the, uh, not the Cadillac, but maybe the El Camino, or we're like notepad of the testing world. So we're like, we get the job done. Uh, so, you know, provide us feedback, use our payloads, use our chain reactions, uh, go out and challenge the assumptions that vendors have on their products, test them, use the Atomic Red Team to make sure that you're going to catch activity that adversaries are going to use uh, in your environments. A couple other references before I close for questions. Uh, Chris Nickerson and Chris Gates have done some really good work in this area. In fact, they uh, sort of inspired us when we first started writing the Atomic Red Team. So check out a couple of their talks on Wild West Hacking Fest. Uh, just a shout out to MITRE again. Also their project Caldera and also Unfetter is another project you may want to explore. Uh, it, it's just different fits for different organizations. So there's our Git repo. Uh, Mike could not be here with me to present, but without his help, this project wouldn't be where it's at. So Mike is currently somewhere in Southwest in an RV. So that's, that's where Mike is. So uh, I think I'm okay. I think I have maybe one or one and a half minutes for Questions, so I'll open it up at this time. Any questions or comments or feedback? That was a lot to cover. Go fast. Okay. Uh, question here? Uh. Okay. Okay. Okay, so yeah, that's a great, yeah, just to clarify, uh, someone in the audience, for those of you who couldn't hear the question, he just clarified that Unfetter is really, really, really about measuring uh, the detections that a tool like uh, Atomic would run. So just make sure that, yeah, so thank you for the clarification, I appreciate it. So uh, I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and pause there, I'll be around here outside or at the bar. Thank you for your time and attention, I appreciate it.